Ok, we're live. Take it away. Hi. Hi there. Can they see us? Yes, I, I guess so. Let, let's see whether they can. You are live. Speak. You're live. We okay. are live. Ok, so Hi, there we are. Hi, uh, I'm Noah. This is Lawrence. Uh, nice to meet you. We are here uh, streaming from the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. And uh, together we are going to present the the um, the comparison between cybersecurity and biology. I hope you are ready. Um, well, I'm ready, so I guess it's just yours anymore. Okay. Um, so nice to meet you. I will just I uh, present. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So our agenda for today. Uh, I have two targets with my uh, presentation. First of all, it show you how beautiful and complex biology is. And the second part will be to make you jealous. So who am I? My name is Noah. I'm a master student at the Weizmann Institute of Science. I'm a junior scientist in Iran, in Tehran, in Nam Lab, uh, that is doing research uh, specifically in microbiome, but also diabetes. And I'm a former cybersecurity researcher at, sec at, at the checkpoint. Um, so until a year ago, uh, I was I was a reverser in Chatcoin. My job was to reverse uh, to as you all I'm sure that you all know about this job uh, to reverse engineering malware and then to implement the the defensive code in, into a Chatcoin uh, antivirus. Um, so you know, I thought I'm pretty I'm pretty smart girl after all. Um, I even did some fuzzing stuff. I found some vulnerabilities. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I built myself up as a hacker and as a researcher, as a researcher in Checkpoint for many years. Um, and then, um, and, but I was always very curious about complex things, not only malware, but always, but also about biology. Um, and a year ago, I decided to come here and to become a, bio, uh, a, a researcher in biology. Uh, specifically about the new uh, the new area in uh, microbiome. So I thought, you know, I'm so cool and I'm doing reverse engineering uh, like for so many years. So, you know, all of the bacteria and the COVID-19 and whatever like comes up, they, they would all like all of them going to be uh, like, you know, scared of me because now there is a good reverse and a good hacker that is coming into the field. But then I found out that... Uh, uh, apparently, it's not as, uh, as I think that we all, uh, I think that uh, it will be really easy for me to prove my point that it's not as uh, as easy as we can, uh, as we thought, uh, until, uh, until not very far. Um, you you can see like uh, what happened when just one one bacteria just became, just uh, did some, some uh, evolution and become just a little bit um, more dangerous than before. It's like uh, the... The COVID, the COVID is doing uh, evolution for many years, and like I think it's really easy to see how the how does it affect like the whole world right now. Um, and also, uh, how I learned in the hard way, biology is way more complex than any malware that I ever did a reverse engineering in. This is like actually one uh, just one slide of of uh, my class. What you see here is uh, the com is the complex system of what happens inside a cell when there is one ligand that that bind that is binding one of the receptors? Um, so apparently, it wasn't the best idea for me. Uh, I'm joking, of course. Uh, I'm very curious, and this uh, area is very challenging for me. Um, and uh, but, and I I think that what we do here is is just beautiful. Um, and also, one more thing that uh, I want to point out during my lecture is that when I tell people about biology, they all think that I'm, you know, pipating and growing, but on growing uh, microbes on a on a plate. But actually, these days, uh, computational bi biology is uh, on the rise, and what we are doing, especially in in uh, in, the, in Weizmann, is trying to take a, a, each of the biology systems that we have in our body or in bacteria or anything else. And build a model about it. This is like also one of my classes, and this is from uh, Uri Alon Lab uh, that we are doing collaboration with. Um, so what he did here, he took uh, he took uh, the alveolar gland and try and tried to build actual uh, equ equations. Of, oh, I think I 
did something, okay? Uh, try to build equation in order to understand uh, this is uh, this thing here is the is the is the uh, complex uh, system of the glands and this one and this one is uh, uh, some equation that are that are uh, explaining why why does diabetes type two uh, develop um, in so many people these days and now we'll pass the microphone to my friend that, that will explain to you in detail about some of the basic creature that all of us has in our body. Thank you very much indeed, Noah. Um, By the way, I just want to point out that the, the, like the person that actually introduced me into this world, it made me a very stressed, uh, a very stressed, also a very, like a very happy student, but also a very stressed and a very poor student, is this guy. So when your mom tells you not to talk to a stranger, maybe she has a point. Okay, so I guess I don't need any further ado. Well, if you can see the camera, you will see that in contrast to Noah, I will be sitting, I'm a little older, so uh, forgive me for that. Um, so actually when we were preparing this lecture, um, we, we, um, <laughs> we, we came up first, you know, with this, with this title, Back to the Future, and me being this, you know, very, a modest, humble German dude that I am. I didn't have all these fancy animations that Noah showed to you. But actually, when I envisioned this presentation, I, I started with something lame looking like this, okay? So uh, again, we are from the Weizmann Institute of Science in, in Israel. And um, what, what I want to show you now in the next like 25 minutes is in essence how computer science and biology not only go side by side, exhibiting stunning parallels, but also that they in fact have an intersection that we can exploit nowadays to address current challenges that we are facing. Um, but before I go into this, um, I actually want to fulfill another request that Noah kindly asked me, which is to explain a very central concept in biology, which by itself also has um, um, a counterpart in computer science, and I'm talking about genetic code, okay? Genetic code, our DNA, is basically the language in which life is written. So that's sort of these uh, chemical molecules that make up uh, four letters, uh, A, T, C, and G, they write a blue blueprint of life um, but as such, they are not very useful because they have to be transcribed. They have to be transcribed from this DNA form, this genetic information, into just another sort of uh, code, which is RNA, which then is sort of translated, so put into um, proteins, uh, protein molecules that make up all our cells and therefore our body as a central component. Um, and speaking about code, I think... Again, it, it's not very far-fetched to reach from biology, so the science of, of uh, life, um, to, to computer science, because you as computer scientists, uh, mostly out there in the audience, you will know what, what a good uh, computer uh, code is. Um, and basically, I want to start by, by asking the question whether there is another analogy between computer science and biology. Are there any parallels in, in terms of computer viruses and biological viruses, because, I mean, as you know, currently we are facing a global uh, COVID-19 pandemic that originates from the uh, deadly spread of the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. And I, I want to raise the question whether there's anything, if you only know computer viruses because you're, you're a cyber expert, that you can also learn about biological viruses such as the this uh, coronavirus. So let's start with a computer virus, right? With a computer virus that you probably heard about, the Melissa in, back in 1999, which um, um, based on, on, on a sequence, like a stretch of code that you can see on the left here, um, which basically with some letters just um, gives also the blueprint of, of, a, of a malware, basically, that, that causes a lot of damage. And I'm not sure whether you're surprised or not, but what you're going to see on the right now here are the first 3,569 letters of the SARS-CoV-2, this coronavirus, the version Wuhan U1, 
the genome, the genetic information of this virus, which in total is about 30,000 letters long, that makes up all this virus that now spreads on the face of the earth. And um, I'm saying genetic information here, but to be precise, this is not uh, DNA that you're seeing, but actually it's an RNA virus. So um, while this is sort of the, the genetic information of this virus, it's, it's not um, the same genetic information that we have in our body cells, but it's only this transcript that I introduced to you before. But, you know, looking at, at this just sequence or this source code of the virus, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to judge that this is particularly harmful. Maybe on the, on the left, you could, you know, Melissa, um, because you're, you're an expert and you see, um, what it actually does. Um, but there is no chance, even the best molecular biologist looking at the code on the right would be able to tell, okay, this is a deadly virus. Okay. So, but still we, we desperately needed to know this sequence to, to detect this virus. Um, but then the question is always, having the sequence, having the source code, what does it do? What does, what is the sequence translated to? Okay. And starting again with the, with the case of, or the example of Melissa, um, basically what this virus did is it, it uh, prompted always to send uh, emails to your own Microsoft Outlook inbox or, or started new uh, word files, which basically then uh, overloaded uh, and completely flooded um, servers, like online servers and stuff. So you had like an, uh, of course, I only made this up, like an uh, infinite inbox. Um, and uh, this is sort of how the source code of the computer virus translates into a 3D structure, if you want to say so, with a malfunction, so with a bad function. And actually the same thing biologists did then, they asked the question, okay, given the sequence of the coronavirus, how does this translate into what I mentioned before, this proteins, right? That make up the, the shell of the virus and, and um, these different parts of the virus that help, it, help the virus to infect our body. Um, and this is basically one part of this virus. So it's not the entire virus, it's just one tool. Actually what I said, like one element, one part of a molecule that helps this virus to infect our body, our body cells. Um, and this is how this virus does harm, right? It infects cells and then eventually kills them. Um, so this is how in biology, a sequence or a source code uh, translates to, to a structure and then a certain function. And then to sort of visualize how it looks like in total, apart from, you know, what it does, the, the Melissa virus to, to overload your inbox and the coronavirus to infect your body cells. Um, actually, for, for the Melissa virus, then it took a, an, an artist to visualize how this overload looks like. And this is how an artist apparently pictures how a computer virus looks like, um, which, as you can probably better judge than I do, um, is just, you know, an arbit more or less arbitrary representation. Um, but in fact, in biology, again, we can use um, this wonderful invention of microscopes to actually look at how, how the virus looks like. Um, however, the conventional light microscopes are not sufficient enough here. So actually, we, we need electron microscopes. However, if we use these uh, very sophisticated apparatuses that cost like a million dollars each and require a lot of expertise to use them, then we can actually see a virus inside of uh, cells, so all these blue particles that in this Forbes uh, article are described as uh, pepperoni, uh, sorry, um, uh, slices of, of, of sausage on your pizza, they are the actual virus. However, I also must say the truth is if you use an electron microscope to observe the coronavirus uh, in cells, so this is actually the coronavirus of the first um, identified U.S. patient, Okay, that was uh, imaged here. Um, this original picture from the electron microscope had no color. Okay, so this blue color is just put up artificially in the end to visualize the virus particles. Um, but here we are still talking about like um, only um, uh, the size of a meter divided by one billion. Okay, so it's uh, in this order of magnitude. So it's uh, very small. Um, and you need sophisticated, as I said, microscopes to actually see it, but you can see it, okay? You can understand how this 
sequence source code information that we that we saw how this translates to um, first individual aspects of of this virus individual molecules and then the virus as such now once it's it has done its terrible job infecting our body cells okay and this is this sort of you know there shows that to some extent there's really there are parallels between computer science and biology in this case uh, computer viruses and biological viruses such as the SARS-CoV-2 um but is there you know besides besides from from this um example is there is there something we can do about this is there something we can use from computer science um to help us fighting this uh, terrible pandemic that we are facing in the US and all over the globe um is there an intersection between computer science and biological aspects of of this pandemic um this is a question no and i basically ask ourselves and in the very beginning of this pandemic uh, in march in fact we um participated in a hackathon that was uh, initiated by uh, indev uh, in collaboration with microsoft they called it hack corona uh, cre creativity will not be quarantined and in the next um 5 to 10 minutes i would like to introduce uh, to you this project that we initiated there to show you how computer science can actually facilitate a very in a very concrete example our um fight uh, against this virus and the the question that that we ask basically is um how can we use computers to to combat covid-19 and the particular question we were wondering about because this was of major concern in the beginning of this pandemics is how to help people who develop severe complications okay because we we understood that asymptomatic patients of course they are very dangerous in terms of uh, unobserved uh, spreaders of this disease but um in case someone develops severe complications needs ventilation in the hospital um then this uh, might um you know present a major challenge for the health system in Israel and all over the world um so how can we basically assess the uncertainty whether a certain covid-19 patient will develop severe uh, uh symptoms and require um hospitalization and ventilation um this is the question we ask and as you can see in this picture again we were uh, pretty much uh using biology as well as computer science by these two mice that you can see here like a computer mouse and an actual mouse or you know at least a stuffed animal of a mouse um and so in simple terms our question was given the fact that we have a certain number of covid-19 patients um that require because they develop severe complications hospital beds how to deal with them if the number of hospital beds is actually lower than the number of patients who require hospitalization in other words 3 exceeds sorry 5 exceeds 3 right so how to decide which of them to to allocate to to the hospital how to estimate what's the fraction of of people who develop severe complications and how to decide whom to offer with a certain priority these uh, available resources okay so this was sort of the question and the reason why we deal with this was because at the Weizmann Institute we are really at the forefront of this not only that we have a medical doctors on campus who see these patients on a day to day basis but also the labs we are working in um from uh, professor dr dr Eran Elinar and professor dr Ido Amit they develop now uh, technologies to not only um uh, detect these uh, infections and stratify these patients but also streamline this process really linking the foundational research with uh, the application in the clinics okay so so this is why we also felt you know dedicated to address this with our expertise which comes more from the from the computational side here so what we did in the beginning is first of all we asked okay what's what's the data we are dealing with right because only if you have data you can actually use computational routines um to to address all these issues um so we we basically simulated based on on existing uh, data an israeli 
um, data set comprised of 10,000 cases where we really used Israeli demographic uh, information and health record data that was publicly available uh, to a certain extent um, and set up set up a, sort of a database where we can get an idea, okay, this is Israeli population. Well, and now given on all these uh, demographic information and health record information, can we basically now sort of estimate what's the fraction of people who might develop severe uh, COVID-19 complications. So first of all, as you can see, we're struggling, you know, entering all this data. But then what we obtained is basically a more or less realistic Israeli uh, age distribution here. Um, and also what seems to be important, and we will hear about uh, diabetes and the metabolic syndrome later on in Noah's part, um, the, the distribution of the body mass index in the Israeli uh, population, um, which is basically a measure for your uh, your body density, so it's it's your body size divided by your uh, body height uh, to the square, and it gives you an estimate of um, if if you have a high BMI, you, you are considered obese, and then actually this also affects the, your risk of COVID nineteen um, severe complications, but also whether you get infected in the first place. But it's not fully understood; it's just an observation. So, anyways, we thought we need to include this information. So, first of all, we needed to have some sort of realistic distribution of this kind of data. And then what we were basically sampling from this information we had back then when Israel was not really facing many, many cases at the time was this sort of distribution of um, people who got infected and then sort of were, were surviving through the disease and people who eventually died. And then you can see that even though the overall frequency of dead people, of course, or of dying people is with with the infection or upon infection, not necessarily caused by the infection, is very low. But you can see that uh, the, if you're older, the, the the probability that you actually die after getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 is higher. Um, so what we what we then did is we used this data set, this information that we that we um, compiled and trained, trained a model to basically predict given a certain patient with, with this uh, health record and demographic uh, information, um, what's the risk of developing severe complications? And then what you can always do is you can compare your prediction to the actually observed risk that, because you have information on this, right? Um, and then we get a pretty good agreement between the predicted risk and the observed risk here in this you know, preliminary data set. And then we can ask the question, okay, what kind of information are actually necessary to, to um, predict this risk in a reliable manner? And then just as a test case, uh, proof of principle, we said, okay, age seems to be relevant and, and, uh, and critical. So what happens if, if, we, if we are leaving out the age information? So, and what you are seeing here is basically a receiver operating characteristic a curve, a rock plot. And basically, if if your line, so your your specificity and sensitivity um, of this prediction performs pretty much randomly, then this line that you see is is close to the diagonal line. So as you can see, the orange line, if we leave out the aid information, we we cannot really predict it. It's like randomly drawing. Okay, this person will will develop complications, or this person won't. But if we just consider the age information as well, in addition to all the other information then um, this prediction becomes very sensitive and very specific. So it means that if we say a person develops, does develop complications, then the chance that this is a true positive indication is, is um, high. But also if we say this person won't develop complications, then also the, the chances that this is a true negative, so it indeed won't develop complications, it's, it's also sort of high. So of course the perfect prediction would be just going straight up and then straight uh, to the right. But also with this, in this toy model sort of or preliminary thing, the performance of this prediction was, was um, not so bad, I would say. So the way we, we envision this basically is um, once people get sick or are suspected of being infected, they have to see a doctor who then um, puts in all the information into a certain uh, database in some device that collects 
this information and then basically trains this, this model that is based on machine learning algorithms um, and all these health record information and then basically puts out back to the doctor um, a certain risk score, right? So it, it, the application tells the doctor, okay, this person exhibits a certain probability to, to develop severe complications, so better save a hospital bed for this one or in the ideal case, um, just it can, this person can just be uh, isolated at home. There is a very low chance that it's going to be severe. Um, just monitor it carefully, but most likely um, the hospital bed allocated to this uh, patient can be given to somebody else with a higher risk. Um, so what, wait, what are we uh, lacking here? We, I already presented to you that this machine learning algorithm sort of works, but we need this device, right? We need this application. Um, and this is also what we what we sort of develop, like uh, something that can work on your mobile phone and helps medical doctors, again, that we have in our group and we talk to them on a daily basis um, to just use it in a very handy way. If they see the patient, they can check, check in all this information in less than a minute. Um, and then basically we can, we can, um, we, we can just let the, uh, the machine learning algorithm do its job and, and see whether there's, there's a certain risk. Um, and of course, this machine learning algorithm that I presented to you, this model that we use there to make the predictions was just the first attempt that we had in this hackathon, you know, very coarse grained, um, uh, first rough trial. Um, needless, needless to say, you can also use um, more sophisticated methods where you can use all these uh, different um, biological information on these patients to assign how important is this um, uh, information to either say that there is a high risk or maybe it's just informative to say that there's a low risk or maybe a combination of both, right? So we can, of course, you always want more data we can try different models. Um, and as I said, we are in day-to-day -day contact with the clinicians actually in charge, actually doing this, actually doing the anamnesis or so talking to the patients, uh, suspected uh, infected people. Um, so this is what, what we envision that we, you know, we can't really not necessarily uh, change the number of uh, people who are susceptible and eventually will get infected. It's just a matter of time, it seems like. Um, and Maybe also, you know, the health system is sort of currently at its limits, so we cannot really expand the number of hospital beds. But this app that we developed, that by the way, we, we call it Virologens because it's like an intelligent solution to virology and inference of, of um, this uh, virus-induced uh, complication, health complications, we could now use to, to assign, again, hospital beds to people who need it the most. So in the scope of this hackathon, which of course is very preliminary and we are still sort of um, thinking of how to, how to put this further, uh, in, the, in the scope of this hackathon, this, this question was solved. But as I already indicated in the scope of this hackathon, and this is just COVID-19, which at the moment seems to be a major part of our lives, but certainly it's not the only part of our life. So um, can we, make a more general observation when we look at computer science and, bio and biology? Um, or in other words, how can we uh, combine powerful algorithms from computer science with biological data sets? And this is what, what I've shown, what I'm showing you here. It's basically the intersection of biological data. This is how biological data nowadays sort of looks like. Um, how can we combine this biology with this more like a conceptual or theoretical view of biology as a system, okay? As a, as a living system that, you know, just operates certain commands and has some input output functions. And the answer here is also the computer because only the computer will help us to process this data and to put it into these sort of models in terms of understanding how biological systems work. And this is a discipline that I actually studied. I did my PhD uh, in this field, which is called systems biology, okay? And uh, let me introduce to you the field of systems biology with one of the godfathers of systems biology, a guy who actually does also a lot of robotics and intelligent design and stuff, a Japanese guy um, who also invented robots that help uh, people to, to um, rescue people from, from uh, collapsed buildings, uh, after earthquakes and stuff, uh, Hiroaki Kitano is his name. 
And he describes systems biology as the integration of experimental and computational approaches to precisely characterize biological systems with quantitative data. Okay, so now we have quantitative data, which is machine readable from biology that we will use to understand in combination with experiments in the laboratory, um, how this biological system works, simulating it at the computer, using algorithms to, to understand what's going on there. And what does go on there? How does this look like? Well, you can imagine as this sort of simple diagram here, where basically on the X axis, you will have time and on the Y axis, you will have the amount, quantitative data, okay, of a biological entity. Now, um, what does this mean? So basically what you have in blue, these blue dots, these are your data points. And then with the computer, you can basically simulate the behavior of the system and you have some mean simulation here, the blue line, but then also you have this shaded region, which is basically your, your uncertainty, okay? Your confidence interval. So not only you get an understanding with the computer, how does the system change over time? How do biological entities change over time? Um, but also how certain are you that this happens, right? The virus can spread it like enormously, but maybe there's also a chance it doesn't spread or maybe there's a chance that it spreads like even more. And this is something we can quantify, we can calculate. Uh, sometimes we have a problem with communicating this, but there are possibilities in mathematics to, to calculate these uh, confidence intervals and these uh, uncertainties. Um, the way this is done, the way we describe how a biological entity changes over time is uh, in mathematics called uh, ordinary differential equation. So this basically describes you how your biological entity B is changing. So the D represents the change. Okay. It's a change of B over the change of time T. Okay. How does B change with time? And this is now depending on certain parameters, P, P1 and P2. And the plus always means, you know, you get something more. So depending on this parameter, P1, you get more of B if you already have B. So if, if you have something that can sort of reproduce, like a virus can reproduce or we can reproduce, you know, you, you will get even more if you are more people to start with, right? And then basically the reproduction rate is, is your parameter P and it's positive because you get more. But then this curve of B is not only going up, it's not only just getting more with time, right? It's also going down. So there's also another parameter P2 and there's a minus because it's getting less that tells me that, that B is, the change of B over time is getting negative. It's, it, there is something subtract, subtracted from it. And of course, the more B we have, the more likely it is that, you know, it destructs itself. You know, humanity is very good at destructing itself somehow, unfortunately. Um, but just by itself, it won't go just up and down there. We need some, another component here that influences this. And this other component is A. So for A, we can actually write down a very similar equation. So how does A change over time? Well, it grows, but not only depending on A, but also on B, because, you know, it, it distracts it, it eats it, for instance. You know, humans are very good at eating stuff, uh, also other living uh, beings. Um, but everything that lives also has to die. So the, the more A we have, the more likely it is that it's also dying with another parameter P4. And then, you know, we get, we get more B, but then A gets more to eat, but then eats more and then B goes down again. So there's little A that can eat up B and B can revive and then it's going up and down. So this is sort of how now with these coupled ordinary differential equations, because there's two of them and they are depending on one another we can describe the system's behavior and even these like weird oscillations, like going up and down like pretty uh, also from a mathematical point of view, a uh, very interesting observation of this system behavior. But now I, I talked about A and B a lot, but saying B, I, I don't necessarily mean a B. Of course, B is also a biological entity, right? The B that gives you honey and stuff, but B could be anything. Honestly, we are talk talking about the human animal, the murin animal like mice, it could be the number of cells that are changing in our body. It could be bacteria that are also in our body, also cells. It can be this virus, right? This is a picture of a virus. Uh, but it can also be just certain molecules that change over time. For instance, here, an antibody that is produced against, against this virus. Um, so these are all options of biological entities that we can describe in biological systems. But to describe them, actually, we have to uh, think uh, on which level are we talking? Um, 
because biology happens on many different scales in space and in time, right? A human being is on the order of uh, magnitude, um, like one to two meters, let's say, you know, uh, maybe basketball players are more like two meters and other people are more like one meter, Never mind. Um, but then we, we talked about uh, a mouse that is certainly not a meter, but more like centimeters. And then we have like cells that you have seen that are more like micrometer, which is a meter divided by a million. Um, and then we have in these cells, we have small subunits um, that are even, even uh, smaller bacteria, also smaller than our body cells. Um, and here we are then in the order of magnitude uh, of uh, um, a meter divided by a billion, okay? So 10 to the minus nine, a nanometer. And, and so, and, and all, at all these scales, you know, changes are happening all the time. That's how we are being alive because molecules are turned over, cells are turned over, our bodies are being turned over. Everything happens there. And this not only happens like uh, on very slow scale, like billions, 3.6 billion years, this earth does exist and life does exist. Um, but also in a matter of hours, in a matter of days, in a matter of minutes, in a matter of seconds, you know, molecules change their conformation in, in the order of, of microseconds. Again, a second divided by one million. So, and, and this all, you know, this is all part of this one biological system that we are trying to describe. And there's no one out there that who can tell me that there's a way to handle this complexity without a computer, okay? So we need computer science to address all this, to understand biology at all these scales. And if you're curious um, for this, uh, don't you worry because there's a wonderful database at bionumbers.org um, initiated at Harvard Medical School um, with you guys in the US where you can ask the question, okay, how big is a cell? How many molecules are in a cell? How does a human body cell is different from a bacterial body cell, from a fruit fly, from a worm? All these numbers are there with references. You can look up the original scientific literature to see the evidence for these numbers. And it's just wonderful looking at, at all this information um, that is out there. And then not only this information is out there, but it's being continuously generated. We are living in a time now in an era where biological data is not, for the first time, not a bottleneck anymore. You don't need to spend three years of a PhD to gather one data point of information about one protein. No, we can now sequence uh, our entire genetic information DNA of a patient upon diagnosis, after treatment, and really understand how our medical treatments affect um, our, our biology on so many levels. So we are living in an era of biological big data. But speaking to you, maybe, of course, I have to say that, in fact, there's only one true big data. Um, but here I, I really speak about um, data in biology that is out there on all of these uh, scales that I've just introduced to you. So data is not a problem anymore, but we need concepts how to work with this data. Uh, and in systems biology, there's two sort of complementary approaches to deal with all this data. So again, data can be on the level of organisms, it can be on the level of cells, or it can be on the level of molecules. But the problem is you, you hardly ever have just one of each of these. So usually you have Right? You have many human beings in a clinical study. You have many different cells that make up our body, uh, like 30 trillion of them to be precise, or many molecules that do something, right? Many virus particles or anything of that like. So you have two different ways to approach them. Either you do it sort of bottom up where you say, okay, I, let's just look at some of these different molecules where we know actually what they are doing, how they interact with one another. Um, and then we try to sort of describe this in a dynamic way, so how they change over time. So first one molecule interacts with another one, and then these two interact with the third one. And then we understand the small part of, like we start from the ground, we, we understand the small part of it, the small module, and then we sort of subsequently try to, to connect these modules. And as I said, there, based on a lot of knowledge, what is going on, we have some mechanistic uh, understanding how these gear wheels are really fit into one another, and then we can see how this system is changing over time. 
But then there's another way to look at a biological system. Let's say a patient, a COVID-19 patient, just look at them from the top. Okay. You don't really know what's going on in this patient. Okay. It's a black box, this patient, but now you give a certain drug to this patient. This is your input into the system, into your black box. And you see how the patient reacts to it. And this is your output, your reaction. And then you do this not only with one, but with the entire cohort of, of uh, COVID-19 patients. And you try to see patterns. Okay, whenever we give this to a certain patient where maybe we have all these uh, health records, um, there's always a good outcome or maybe a not so good outcome. And then you can start to try to understand this input-output relationship. Needless to say, for this, you need a lot of data, many patients, many drugs that you, that you potentially test. Um, but then you can learn sort of associations. Okay, um, uh, uh, smoking history is always connected to a bad outcome, or as we said, a high BMI is always connected to a bad outcome. And these are all these machine learning, artificial intelligence methods. Okay. Um, so these are sort of the two complementary, not schools of thoughts, but approaches. They are not mutually exclusive, right? Because you can, while looking at these patients as a black box, you can still start with some, for instance, cells of the immune system that are attacked by the virus. You can also start with some bottom-up modeling there, and then you can, in the end, put it all together. Um, but to give you a precise example, I want to use the bottom-up approach now as an example, okay? So again, where we look at how biological entities change over time. And actually these models, particularly also with these going ups and down, these oscillations, um, they were introduced a long time ago for, for um, foxes and rabbits. Um, but biology is not just that, and in fact, um, I wrote a book um, on um, rabbit-free um, sort of biology. However, we can still use all this mathematics that was established to now bring um, this research back to the future, using this mathematics to understand something about molecular biology. And the, ex the last example I, I want to give you before I hand over back to Noah um, is the example of a of a molecule that controls the survival of our red blood cells. Um, it has this complicated name, signal transducer and activator of transcription, uh, STAT5. Um, the only thing you need to know about this molecule is it can bind DNA, okay? It can bind our genetic information and then um, exert certain tasks there. And if we have it, our red blood cells are surviving. And if this uh, molecule is not at our genetic information doing its job, then uh, red blood cells are dying. And so do we at some point. So this molecule basically shows us a life death decision, um, which starts with a simple, very simple question. Does one plus one always give two? Because if we have two of these molecules, they are supposed to form this complex of two molecules. Um, and this sounds simple, but actually biology is more complex than that because we not only have one family member of this molecule, we have two of them, the blue one and the red one. Um, and also this can be modified. It can be chemically modified to be, to be switched. So this small p here is, is a chemical group that can be added to this molecule. And then it's switched from the off state um, by this addition of this chemical to the on state. And so we basically have four different uh, molecules that potentially can do this job of binding genetic information and, and making sure our blood cells are surviving, which gives us a matrix of, of potential biological age entities here, right? Not this kind of matrix, but more like this kind of matrix. Um, so from all these molecules, we can form these potential complexes. And now the, the problem is they are very small, so we cannot just look at them to see which of them do actually exist and, and what do they do. Um, but we do have experimental data um, where we see how these complexes change over time. So what we see here in, on the top is basically we see how many of the switched on molecules we have as compared to all possible molecules. And then we also see how the number of the blue molecules compared to all molecules change over time. And then here we basically see how these two um, ratios change with respect to one another, okay, in, in, in these cells. Uh, we can measure this and then with a mathematical model we can basically describe we can describe this data as you can see again we have our our simulation and also the confidence interval here and now with the simulation we can basically look back and see okay which kind of molecules from this mat matrix do actually exist i mean which one of those we need to describe this data 
And the answer is surprisingly few of them we only need, okay? And this is something we cannot just look at. We really need to compute, we had needed the computer to find out, okay, what's the probability that these molecules exist? And this we also published, it's not an A work, but again, A and B, because these are two molecules. And with this, maybe we, we better understand now how our red blood cells are surviving and, and be happy. So to wrap this all up, um, what, what, what I've shown to you is basically there are stunning parallels between computer viruses and biological viruses. Um, we can apply computational algorithms to address challenges that we are facing in the COVID-19 pandemic. And systems biology helps us to answer complex biological questions with quantitative data. For instance, how molecular switches decide between life and death in our blood. And Noah will give you some more teases, uh, teasers how, how this all relates. I'm just saying, if you feel like intrigued by this, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we will be happy to, to also um, share more information. And with, having said that, I hand over back to Noah. Hi, and uh, welcome back. For anyone that uh, lost my that uh, join us after the after my introduction, I will just explain again that uh, um, that my name is Noah. I'm a junior master scientist at the Weizmann Institute of uh, Science uh, here in Israel, and my background is from uh, is uh, my background is uh, as most of you guys. Uh, I was a uh, reverse engineering and. Uh, cybersecurity expert at Checkpoint for many years. And when I joined Weizmann, I had to close a, a, a huge gap in my, in my knowledge in biology. Um, and I was, uh, what was stunning for me was the parallels that I found uh, so often in, my materi in the material that I studied in the courses and also for the lab uh, with, my, with the, the knowledge that I have from the past. So uh, I will just give you a few examples of, uh, of uh, the things we have in, in biology that will look uh, very, uh, very familiar for you. So uh, without, any without any further um, introduction, let's uh, start with the cancer cells. Okay, so cancer cells, uh, unlike most of the people think about them, uh, they are not just uh, cancer that, that accumulate in our body. This is more like super so, so, uh, uh, cells that in our body that have superpowers. They evolve, they evolve the, uh, better than the rest of the cells in the body, like due to, to, due to a mutation from uh, a radiation, from, from a UV light or from any other, uh, from smoking and from, uh, or just by chance in, in the body. And then what's happening with these cells is that they become selfish. Which means that instead of uh, of uh, working together for the, like with the rest of the cells in the body, they just they are they are selfish enough to to, to try to control uh, to control and to get all of the resources. For example, to be uh, to they are actually sending signals to the to the body to build the, to build veins in order to get more oxygen into the tumor into, into the tumor tumor environment, and uh, one. Uh, uh, one stunning fact that I learned uh, during during my courses is that not only that the cancer cells are, are selfish, they also try to evade the immune system uh, in or, because uh, one of the roles of the immune system is not, not only uh, to uh, eliminate pathogens but also eliminate cells that are selfish, like cancer cells. Because cancer cells, like we have them on a regular basis in our in our body. Um, and this is one of the main roles of the immune system to 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 detect them and uh, and uh, and to eliminate them. So uh, it's not only that the, that the, our immune system is working as an anti antivirus, but the thing here is that the cancer cells are fighting back. So the picture here is represented an interaction between cancer cells and different types of immune cells. Uh, cancer cells are the one that shows in blue. Immune cells are in different colors, and uh, what they are trying to do uh, is uh, to send. So you can you can think about the rest of the the, the rest of the colorful cells as uh, different types of antivirus from uh, many different companies, and uh, or many or maybe uh, different models that, they, that we have in uh, one antivirus. And what the cancer cell is trying to do is to actually reprogram or to send uh, to to send uh, signal to send signals. Uh, to the different immune cells in order to, in order to evade them. 
Um, and this is something that I was, you know, when I heard about it, it was really familiar for me. Like I reversed many malwares that tried to evade my VM, to evade my, to evade my, my, uh, my uh, IDA, my OLED, my OLED BG, uh, all the antivirus in general. And uh, so uh, for me, it sounds uh, pretty familiar. So apparently we, did, we, we, it wasn't uh, our idea to evade, uh, to evade people that, uh, to evade uh, uh, entities that are trying to detect us. Uh, and uh, I can promise you that councils are doing it in a uh, in a much more efficient way. Uh, for example, one uh, one very stun one very stunning uh, example that I have um, is that uh, every cell is supposed to present to present a, a, a molecule on his surface, which and it's the name of the molecule is an MHC. And this molecule and this molecule is actually like is uh, it's like the info. Uh, that uh, an executable can have, uh, which is, which describes what uh, what what these cells are uh, are producing, what are the proteins that are running in, inside of it, and cancer cell. What they actually do is they just they just don't show, they just don't present these MHC, these MHC molecules. So the so it's really hard in, in uh, for the immune cells to understand what actually going is going on inside of them, um, and. Uh, here you can see uh, something that we call a hot tumor. Uh, if a tumor is uh, immunologically hot, it means that the immune system is operation here. Uh, however, when cancer progress, it, it learns how to deactivate immune cells and make tumors uh, immunologically call. Like look at this uh, tumor, and, you, and we can see here many, diff many different of uh, M many different of immune cells that are trying to detect and to like you know trying to uh, att get attacked to it and to understand what's going on inside. But after after a while, what we can see in uh, in tumors that are actually uh, successful with evading the immune system is that they become uh, immunologically called tumor. And you can see that like most of the most of the immune cells they just gave up and like you know went to like they said okay whatever like I have other stuff to do and they just you know left the tumor there alone and uh, this is why uh, like so many uh, this is why uh, you get uh, the tumor uh, in your body and here is just uh, here what you can see here is just a, a a network of the different this is just you know this is just a brief a, a brief uh, knowledge that we have so far about uh, about how all the different all the different ways that cancer help that cancer has in order to try to evade the immune system. Um, generally, cells can communicate with each other using diverse uh, signal uh, transaction networks that lead to different outcomes. And what cancer cells do, they upregulate the pathways with, which inhibit normal normal uh, functioning of immune cells. They don't they they don't they don't even just uh, uh, tell the like the, the specific immune cell, you know, just leave me alone. They also ask him to spread the, the rumor and tell him and tell the rest of the immune cells, you know, this guy, it's okay, like it's okay, you can just leave him alone. Um, and this is uh, something that was really fascinating for me to learn. Um, and here is an example uh, where cancer cell overexpressing PDL1, a, me a molecule that suppresses a T cell. Important cell type involved in cancer cell elimination. Uh, on the right, you can also see a reprogrammed immune cell called tumor associated macrophage, which helps to spread the, and the inactivating signal instead of fighting cancer. Okay, so you can see that it's not only telling him, listen, I'm okay. It also ask him, uh, you also ask these cells, uh, you can also tell the rest of the guys that I'm fine and like to leave me alone. And this was amazing. I don't know like too many models that are actually uh, so uh, so powerful and sophisticated and it was amazing for me to learn. Um, and my next example, which is actually one of my, uh, like uh, one of my favorites is bacteriophage. Okay. So what is a bacteriophage? Here you can see, I, I like, let's, uh, let's take a look at this very beautiful, uh, uh, GIF, um, of, uh, of, uh, like, okay. So I'll just explain. First of all, my bacteriophage is like my favorite creature so far. Um, and what it's actually doing, there is a, a creature that we all know, it's named for bacteria, but there is also another tiny, tiny picture and the, the and the, what the bacteriophage is actually trying to do is to inject its DNA 
into the bacteria, and then the bacteria, instead of, uh, of uh, running their own genome, it will run uh, the bacteria of a genome. Like, and does, does it sound familiar to anyone else? And so apparently also with this, we didn't come up. Um, and this was amazing for me to understand, like you can actually see it. This is actually a bacteria. Okay, and here you can see a bacteriophage that are uh, attaching into it and injecting their the, the genome into the uh, bacteria. And here you can see this is a very sad story because the bacteria, like, you know, sometimes they understand that they are like, you know, they are uh, doomed, um, but this is just a gift. And so we'll just explain a bit about, about, uh, about the progress of it. So what, uh, what you see here is that there is attachment of the bacteriophage into the bacteria. Bacteria is uh, uh, like, you know, the bacteria that you, that you know that we all have in our body. And this is the bacteriophage, and then, and the, which has a very, very uh, nice and interesting picture and, and structure. And so what it's doing is actually attaching into the bacteria. It's injecting, it's injecting in uh, the, its own genome into the bacteria uh, inside surface. And then the bacteria, instead of running, like you see, this is the genome of the, of the, of the bacteria, instead of running like its own code, it's running the bacteriophage code. And then like the whole purpose of it is that uh, the, there, were, uh, there are more and more bacteriophages that are uh, get, uh, like uh, being formed inside of the bacteria. And then uh, the, the poor bacteria, you know, it just, uh, just full of, of bacteriophage until they release each other, until they get like, the, it's, it's too much for it and it, they just go out and infect even more and more bact uh, bacteria that are inside of this environment. Um, and uh, another thing uh, that I'm pretty sure that most of you heard about, if you are in interested in biology at all, is uh, something that is called CRISPR. So we all know that CRISPR is being used these days in order to uh, kind of uh, engineering the babies of the future and stuff like this. But what was fascinating for me to learn is that it's actually cr uh, CRISPR, the whole purpose of it is, uh, this is a, a defense mechanism of the bacteria in order to detect bacteria, in, in order to uh, detect phages. So what you see here is that uh, like this, this pink uh, evil thing is the bacteria. And what it's trying to detect and this is uh, something that we actually stole from them is what it's trying to detect is the sequence that he also had, that he uh, that he was uh, detected that he saw before of phages that try to attack it and the way that it's and the way that it's doing this is just you know he has a sequence that uh, he remember and then he just try to uh, do pairing, like to compare the, the new, the new uh, DNA that he see inside of, of, its, of uh, the cell and, uh, and, uh, the, and the sequence that he already know that is belong to the phages. Um, so, uh, yeah. So of course, uh, I think it's very, it's a, uh, uh, it's very obvious that uh, this uh, this Cas9 system is very similar to what we know as the MD5 or the hashes of the malware that we have inside uh, uh, many different antiviruses. Um, and another very cool thing is that it's not only that the bacteria is uh, detecting phages in, like uh, uh, using the non sequence is that the phages are actually evading this defensive system by changing their genome the same way that malwares are changing their md5 you know it's it's enough to change just one a bit just one bit phages are doing the same in order to uh, to uh, it, like you know via evolution in order to be able to uh, to inject their code into new bacteria um, and so this mechanism that we actually stole from bacteria, we will, uh, the, we are trying these days to use it for genetic engineering. Um, but uh, just so you know, like it, it, we, it wasn't our idea. We stole it from a very, uh, actually smart creature apparently. Um, and I will just, uh, um, since our time is up, I will just uh, say briefly what's uh, like the whole role of our, of our specific lab. So what you see, so my so my uh, research my research is uh, specifically about the microbiome. What is the microbiome? Is uh, what we are trying to do, as you as you all 
Uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but we are all full of uh, bacteria inside of our inside of our gut, and we are trying in our lab uh, to uh, to understand and maybe in the future also to manipulate the different bacteria that are inside of our gut and all the networks that are inside of it. Uh, first of all, we try to find the connection between them and different diseases like uh, diabetes and uh, ALS and uh, obesity. Um, and so this is a, a, a very new and interesting field. And uh, you should know that uh, you, ha you all have bacteria all over your hands, uh, your eyes, and specifically inside your gut. And it's not just that they are there happily, like not doing anything. They're actually sometimes very crucial um, in, uh, in, in, in order to keep the uh, homeostasis. Um, so this is was just a brief uh, thing about the microbiome, just a brief uh, introduction to the microbiome. Uh, just a few things that we are do that we found out so far in our lab is the connection between the bacteria that are inside the gut and the very well known diseases that are inside the ALS because uh, the bacteria that they can they can send signals from the gut into the into the brain and there is a there is a very uh, clear connection between uh, the dysbiosis that we'll see in the gut and the and the uh, um, and the form of this disease. Um, here you can see many different uh, many different types of disease that are linked to uh, to this process in the microbiome. And another very uh, cool and another very cool uh, subject we are looking into in our lab is diabetes. Um, just one thing that I I learned and it's very it was really interesting and uh, uh, and. Uh, like this is one of the, my favorite challenges uh, in, in this field is that when you have any kind of disease, it's not like that, for example, diabetes, if you have too much sugar in your blood, the, the problem in the problem with it, it will, like wouldn't be what will just about the fact that you have too much sugar in your veins. Like many different diseases, uh, they're like there is a hip corruption, let's say, let's say in our body but unfortunately unlike in the new operation systems in our body there like if there is no such thing as uh, different processes that have different uh, that, uh, that have different uh, classes of memory so if there is so if there is hip corruption in one process or in one part in, in one in one uh, system in our body it affects the rest of it as well so uh, for example in diabetes one of the problems that we see, that we see is that uh, there, uh, that uh, there we we lose the homeostasis of uh, of of uh, of also also the uh, the the CA two inside our uh, uh, in, inside each of our cells, um, and actually we can we can see that uh, the blood is become is becoming acidic. Um, so this is just one thing, and uh, so. I would just say briefly, like that, I'm really proud, like I really, really proud that taking uh, part of my lab. Like this is uh, the the very nice person that you see here is my uh, supervisor. I have a professor, also a supervisor, and he recently used me as a as a lab rat. Uh, what you see here is an insulin is an insulin sensor that uh, that was attached to my shoulder for around three weeks. Um, but uh, I'm of course very proud, like. Uh, uh, I wish for myself and for everyone always to be in the side of uh, like uh, to help uh, to help patient get a, a, like a better cure. Um, and this is something that I'm really happy about. Like that I'm actually what I'm doing here. It's actually like helping people that, uh, helping people that are sick. Um, but uh, yes, like I also the, also do st we also all of us actually do stuff like this in the lab. Also, the reason that uh, this guy is dressed like this is because, like during the corona, during the corona, our all lab uh, beca became. Uh, they ch of course, we it like we are not uh, we are not uh, doing doing anything that is linked to uh, to uh, to to corona. Uh, we di we didn't do anything that uh, that is uh, about it like before. But uh, during the during this uh, break uh, this uh, breakdown of uh, like.